2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter number 4, if you would please. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and uh, we're looking in the, uh, the swan song of the Apostle Paul. This is uh, where he writes uh, his closing remarks as to uh, uh, being inspired of God to uh, get the word of God out. Uh, to each and every one that he possibly could, and being under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, uh, he leaves off in chapter 3 uh, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And then he comes out and he says, I charge thee, Timothy, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Paul has given us the understanding that we have the inspired, inerrant word of God. And then he has a charge or a challenge, a command for Timothy, as well as each and every one of us, and he says this charge is given before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead, those that uh, are alive and dead at his appearing in his kingdom. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ coming back very soon. Paul believed the Lord was coming back in his time and in his day. And then he says to Timothy as well as to us, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And you know, he talks about taking the word of God and just uh, that he gives us in verse 16 of chapter 3 that it is inspired of God and that it is to be preached. Uh, to preach the word in, uh, at the instant, in season, out of season. And with the word of God, he is to rebuke. Reprove and he exhort with long suffering and with doctrine. We are living in a time where a lot of folks aren't so sure about doctrine. They say, well, we can all, you know, believe what we want to believe, but the Bible doctrines are all true, and we stand based upon the scripture, the word of God. He says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Verse 7. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearance. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Sessians to Galatia, and, Timothy, and Titus, and to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark. Bring him with thee, for he is profitable unto me in the ministry. And uh, Tychus have I sent to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. Alexander the gold coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. And by me the preaching might be fully known that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto a heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We do thank
Thank you, dear Father, for the Apostle Paul and what he has for us today. And Lord, what he is writing here 2000, over 2,000 years ago is very relevant, very real to us today in 2017. So, Father, I pray that thy Holy Spirit would guide us through these principles and these truths. And, Father, may we glean them into our hearts and our lives and be led of the Spirit of God as we are sensitive in our hearts to his Holy Spirit. We ask, Father, that you would bless now our message. And, Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, it is our prayer, it's our desire that they would be saved before it's eternally too late. But, Father... Not only those here without Christ, but Lord, this week you will send this small army as well as Christian army men and women around this world will go out. Help us all to go out with a concern of reaching others for Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And the people said, Amen. 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 Well, Paul here has come and uh, is finishing out the letter that he is writing here to Titus. And he has some important things to say. Down in verse number 13, he says, The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee. Have you ever left something behind? Have you ever left something behind? Have you ever <laughs> taken off and, and, and gotten down the road and realized, oh man, I've got to go back and get it? Or maybe you've gone too far. Now, when I, we pastored, I pastored down in Abbotsford, I, I remember a time or two that I've gotten home, and Regina's gotten home, and there's Sarah and Leah and David, but where's Andy? Andy was back at church sleeping on a pew. And uh, so sometimes you can go off and leave somebody that's very important, amen? And uh, 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 Paul had left his cloak, his overcoat, if you please, uh, his mantle. He had left it at Troas. And now he's telling Timothy, he says, when you come, make sure you bring my coat with me. And he says, bring the, 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 uh, uh, the books, but especially the parchment. And then I want you to notice verse number 21. And verse 21 says, do thy diligence to come before winter. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Hey, winter's coming. Please, Timothy, would you bring me my coat? Has that ever happened? Now, I know teenagers today, they think that they can go out without wearing coats. And I know my kids were that, that, were that way. And they think, boy, they're just going to get in the car and everything's going to be fine. They're going to go to the mall or go to the store and they just get and go out and, you know, don't really need to have a coat. But I tell you, it's something that is so very important here in northern D.C. you got to have a coat with you. Amen? Amen. And uh, so Paul is writing here to Timothy and he gives him some things to say, but he, he, he makes it sure that he does his diligent to come before winter. Now, Paul had a number of things that was on his mind as he was writing under the inspiration of God. And the first one, I want you to notice what he has to say in verses 1 here. He's writing to him and he says, Timothy, I charge you before God and our Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ is coming again, he says, I charge you to preach the word. It is so important that the preaching of the Word of God goes forth. And he says, with this preaching, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering. Why was Timothy being told this by the Apostle Paul? Because the carnality of the people. You say, well, what do you mean the carnality of the people? Notice, if you would, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. Now he's not necessarily talking to the unsaved. He is talking about saved people. He is talking about a time when people in churches all over and on radio and television and the internet, they're going to be listening to people and they're going to be wanting to know more and more and have a desire for knowledge, but that knowledge is not truthful knowledge nor honest knowledge. And so he says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is that doctrine which comes from the Word of God and not the mind of man. Amen, Amen preacher. And we see this so very clear. He says, after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. 
They shall turn away from their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Here he says, you know what? There is a carnality coming amongst the people of God, the flock of God, if you would please. And he says you need to make sure that the preaching of the Word of God goes forth. And with that preaching, it's to be instant, in season, and out of season. Now, <clears throat> you know what in season is? In season is when the fruit's coming in. When there's some results of that what is happening. But he said, you know what? You need to preach it when people are getting right with God and they're making good decisions and, and, and they're living out their lives and wanting to in season a time in which things are happening. He said, but by the way, Timothy, you preach the Word of God out of season as well. When nobody's making any decisions for God, when the fruit is not coming forth, when people are becoming cold and indifferent to the things of God, where people don't think they need to have prayer, where people don't think they need to hit an altar. And that's one of the things that I'm going to be excited about. When we build our building, we'll have an altar. And we'll have altar calls. And we'll give people opportunities uh, to make some decisions for God. And, and that's so important. He says the time will come when they're not going to endure the sound doctrine. Matter of fact, they are going to turn away from it. And they're going to begin to listen to uh, fables and things of this nature. And so he said, listen, Timothy, verse 5. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make foolproof thy ministry. He's saying, listen, that you remind that this church and your churches and the people of God, we are all going to face God. Isn't that what he says back in verse 1? Verse 1, he says, Therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing. Everybody's going to face God someday. So, you know, we think we can live our lives the way that we want to and do what we want to without any accountability, and that's the problem that we have. We have taught children, we have taught teenagers, we have taught now our adults, our judges and lawyers, that man evolved from an animal, and so we have an animal instinct, and so we're not accountable to anybody. You might have read in the paper this week that the boy who, who, uh, who uh, uh, killed the gophers and tortured the gophers, skinned them alive and cut their feet off and, 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 and just did this hideous uh, action to a, a little gopher and, and, and skinned it alive and everything. He has the, the markings of a psychopath. And yet the judge threw it out. Now that family needs some help. That boy needs some help. Believe you me, he needs some help. But what do you expect when you teach a young person he's just an animal? That the young person, that people are not accountable to God. And that's what has been going on in our day and in our age. And so we have well, sold to the wind and we have reaped a whirlwind. And now we have people that are acting like animals because there's no facing God. And yet we understand and we see that Paul is writing to Timothy. And he says, you preach the word to them. And he says, you endure the affliction. You do the work of an evangelist. That's to get people saved. You make full proof thy ministry. He says, as far as I am concerned, I want you to know I'm ready. He says, I fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Uh, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the righteous judge shall give me at that day, but not only to me also, but to all them that love His appearing. Let me tell you something. We ought to love and know that His appearing. We ought to be excited about it. A lot of churches today, they, they're so confused about the second coming. And they, they, they get in a little bit of arguments and everything about the second coming. I believe the Bible is very plain that He's coming again. And that's what we need to understand. He is coming again. Notice what He says in verse 9. Do thy diligent to come shortly unto me. He said, you know what? You need to make your plans and you need to do diligently to make your way. And as you come, uh, he, 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 he brings it out that there are those that, that uh, 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 when you come, it's so important. But he also warns them to come to him shortly. He says, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. You see, there are those who have compromised the faith. Demas was one of them. According to Philemon chapter 1, verse 24, that Demas, uh, uh, Demas walked and worked with the Apostle Paul. He was one of his, the Bible says, a fellow laborer of Paul. 
He was a man that worked right alongside Paul, that saw Paul pray and witness and preach and understood some things that Paul was doing. And he was with him day and night and labored with him. And now the Bible makes it very plain that he compromised and the faith and he left. He says, for demons has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Paul was in prison. Demas looked around and slept in there. He said, man, I'm not going to have anything to do with that jailbird. Uh, he, he got put in prison. He got put in jail. Matter of fact, that's where you'd find Paul in most towns. You either see him at the synagogue preaching or you'd see him over in the jail because he was preaching. And then the demon said, you know what? I'm going to leave him alone. He did not want to identify with the apostle Paul. He did not want to identify with suffering and danger. And, and, and just got a little uh, article I read about a lady that's written a book and it, I can't remember the title of the, the book that she wrote but it's something like this it's dangerous to be a believer it's dangerous to be a believer you know there's a lot of truth in that today to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ it's going to be a lot more dangerous today in 2017 than even it was 2016 we need to understand that when we as a Christian, we will suffer persecution. We need to prepare ourselves for that. We need to prepare our families for that. We need to prepare people to understand that we will suffer. Here Demas said, you know what? Paul's in jail. I'm not going to identify with him. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to be in a dangerous situation. I want to compromise. I want to have comfortable Christianity. That's what a lot of people want. They want the comforts of Christianity without understanding what it is to have the commitment of Christianity. He loved this present world more than the world to come. He loved this present world more than the world to come. Let me show you someone real quickly, the opposite of Demas. Hold your hand here and go back to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11 and look with me if you would please uh, down in verse number 23 by faith Moses when he was born was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they would not uh, 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 excuse me they were not afraid of the king's commandment now I want you to notice verse 23 is not Moses' faith here. This is the faith of his parents. The Bible says by faith Moses when he was born was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child. Here was some parents who knew what God meant more than what the government meant. And they would rather obey God rather than man. The king has said that he wanted all the little boy children to be thrown into the river Nile. He wanted all the little boy children to be killed. And yet here, by faith, they believed God. They trusted God. They were not afraid of the king's commandments, the Bible said. They said, you know what? We're going to raise this child up. We're not going to give him over to give it. This is our child. We will raise him. And it's by their faith. Parents, it's by your faith. It's by your faith as you lead and direct your family. Men and ladies, it is by your faith. But notice verse 24. By faith, when Moses was come to years, refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughter. Now here, Moses exercised faith. First we see his parents' faith in the time of danger, in a time of suffering, they believed God. They trusted God. They said, Lord, we're going to put baby Moses out here amongst the bulrushes in the river Nile there. And there's crocodiles there, yes. And there's spiders in there. Oh, can you imagine that? Yes, there's spiders in there. And there's, there's spiders and there's snakes. And all is that in the river. And it could be dangerous. But we're going to trust God in putting him there than to let God then, then give him over to the government. Give him over to Pharaoh. And they believe. And because they believe in a time of suffering, a time of danger, a time of trial, notice that Moses believed. Parents, your kids 
will have faith if you have faith. If you step out and believe God, your kids will have that as a godly example. An opposite of Demas. Notice if you would, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Listen to this. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. Then to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. He chose to, to, to the, the, the suffering and the affliction of God's people. He made a choice. And it was a faithful choice. A cho choice of faith. Look at verse 26. Esteeming the approach, the approach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto recompense of the reward. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. I want you to realize Demas did not have recompense of the reward. Demas chose rather this world instead of the next world. Having loved this present world. Let me tell you something. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. Our home is up there somewhere around the blue. Amen? Amen. Our life is as a vapor it panteth, uh, it appeared for a little while and then vanishes away. Here we see that Demas having forsaken, he, 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 he compromised and he loved this present world. Look down in verse number 14. He had an adversary as well. He had a foe. He says, And Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Here he had someone. Paul, uh, you know, make no mistake about it. Paul knew what it was to have enemies. He knew what it was that when he took a stand for God, there would be those that went against him. And by the way, Paul was not afraid to name names. Paul was not afraid to name names. Now I know that there are some good Bible teachers on the radio and television. G uh, David Jeremiah, Warren Wiersbe, Nahan, all those other guys that are on the radio. And uh, the Bible is filled with good Bible teachers and such. But one of the problems that Charles Stanley and and Andy Stanley and some of these preachers and everything is that they are afraid to name names. Come on. This is the truth. They will not call out sin. They will not call out by somebody by name. They will not tell you that T.D. Jake is one that believes in, in, in a oneness instead of believing in the Trinity. He, uh, he believes in a oneness theology. He doesn't believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And yet he's a black preacher that, that has a lot of people listening to him. But they won't call him out by name. And there's a lot of other preachers they won't call out by name. Though they're teaching heresy and though they teach that. These are some guys that are good at teaching the Bible. They're right on in some of the Bible teaching. But they're afraid, unlike the Apostle Paul. Paul knew what it was to call out names. We've got a fellow that's on the inter uh, interstate internet. Uh, that, that's preaching all over on the internet and he gets on to people and uh, uh, he, 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 uh, he really uh, is a, a, a heretic. And man, people are following after him. A lot of churches, they have people in their churches that listen to this guy and, and, uh, and so they, they, he caused a lot of problems in local churches. And he's from Phoenix, Arizona. If I could think, think of his name right now, I'll tell you what his name is. I can't think of his name. Steve Anderson. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Steve Anderson is his name. And I have known preacher after preacher after preacher that had people come to their church and say, oh, we watch Steve Anderson on YouTube and, and, and he's a teacher of this and he teaches that and he teaches this. Let me tell you something. He does not teach what is right in this Bible. Now, he's a King James man, but let me tell you something. He's not following the Scripture in this. And he's caused a lot of havoc in a lot of churches all across North America and around the world. But Paul was not afraid to name names. He described him, not only did he name his name, but he described him because there's other Alexanders mentioned in the Bible. And he says, this is Alexander the coppersmith. I mean, he named him, not only his name now, but told him what he did. As a thing. Uh, uh, we don't know what all it was that was there, but he greatly withstood the words of God's man and of the words of God. Notice what he said. 
He did me much evil. The Lord rebuked him according to his works. For of whom he written, uh, uh, Be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. Now, Paul preached the word of God and was under the inspiration of the word of God as he preached. And he's warning Timothy and preparing Timothy that there are those that are out there and you need to be aware of them. And I say this to our folks, and if, if folks have been around here for years, check me out. If, if things that if it doesn't line up with the scripture, let's talk about it. Let's see what the word of God has to say. I'll be glad to sit down with anybody. I've sat down with a lot of folks and say, okay, what does this say the scripture? And, and such. And if I'm wrong, I'll be glad to admit that I'm wrong. And I'm not right on everything, I'm not perfect on everything. But I do believe the Word of God is perfect. And I do believe that when things are taken in context, it's very simple to understand. He says, Do thy diligent to come before winter. Winter is a, a picture of fruitlessness. No blossoms, no fruit, no produce. The trees are leafless. They're empty, they're bare, they're ugly, not beautiful, and not very attractive. The darkness that is there, the longer nights, the shorter days, the less light that is available. The coldness, the, 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 there's no natural heat, there's uh, the, there's the uh, extremity of coldness and the deadness that is there. Paul says, do thy diligence to become before winter. You know, spiritually, some people can be in the middle of winter. We need to move on. We don't need to be in that place where we're fruitless or leafless, where that there's darkness and coldness and indifference in our hearts and lives. We need to be right with God. We need to go onward and forward as God would have us to go. Let me give you three thoughts. Number one, he had a special cloak. Verse 13. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carthus, when thou comest, bring it with it. This cloak was special. He, on his third missionary journey, the last time he was through Troas, that was the time that when he was preaching long after midnight, and there was a fellow up in the up in the uh, loft up there, and the, the oil and the candles and all the lights that was up there. And Paul was preaching long, and, and the fellow up there fell asleep. Can you imagine somebody falling asleep in church? And the fellow fell asleep after midnight, and after he fell asleep, he fell from up there and hit the ground and died right there. Of course, Paul reached over and raised him back to life. His name was Eutychus. I remember that because I was told as a little kid that you'd cuss too if you'd fall asleep when dead. But I didn't know that. But anyway, that's a good way to remember his name. I do. But Eutychus, Paul raised him back up. That special cloak that was there, that cloak was a fallus. It was a traveling coat. It was made for protection against the stormy weather. That cloak, he says, when you come, bring it. That cloak is a picture of God's power for us today. That cloak is a picture of God's power. When we look at Elijah and Elisha, and Elisha said to Elijah, when you go up, would you remember me? And Elijah told Elisha, when I go up, I will remember you. And Elijah did seven miracles. And as Elijah did seven miracles, and as he was taken up in a chair of fire, Elisha cried out, my father, my father, the horseman of Israel. And Elijah threw down his mantle. And there, Elisha picked up the mantle of God, and he went out and he did 14 miracles with that mantle. Elijah did seven. Elisha prayed, give me a double portion of God's power. And Elisha did 13 miracles. And the 14th miracle was when he was dead. And in a tomb, there were some people traveling and a guy died. And so they dropped him down into the tomb of Elisha. And when that man touched the bones of Elisha, he came back to life. Can you imagine that? Oh, my brother, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead, oh, he's dead, oh. And they would weep and wail. Oh, here's the tomb, let's drop him down in that tomb. Our brother's dead, he's dead, they drop him down. Oh, what? Did you hear that? He's down there hollering, get me out of here, get me out of here. I want you to know the mantle was a double portion of God's power.
power. And here, Paul says, the presence of the picture of the power of God upon Elijah. He said, I want to have that. He, he could not stop the winter. Winter was coming, but he could not stop the winter. But he said, you know what? I can have protection against it. And you know what? You and I, we cannot prevent it getting cold and indifferent. And the things that are happening all around us, the longer uh, nights and the shorter days, and the coldness and the deadness and the fruitlessness and the leafless and all of that. But let me tell you something. God can prepare our hearts against it. We come to Him for His power, for His beauty, and for that which He has for us. It is a protection from the storm. It will keep us warm from the cold of this world. Let me tell you something. We need the man of God in our lives. How do we get it? We ask God for it. Every day, Lord, keep my heart warm and tender and open to the things of God. And have a desire to have the power of God. Secondly, the comfort. Verse 13 again. He says, When thou come, bring us with thee the, book, uh, the books and the, especially the parchment. Now, the parchment, that was a, a, a membrane of a sheepskin. They would take sheepskin and they would write upon it the word of it. He said, you know what? Bring the books, but especially the parchment. He said the books were important. We wanted the scrolls that were there. But he said, I want that parchment that the lamb had actually died to give its skin so that they would write upon. And it was the word of God. He said, I want the books, but especially the parchment that would be there. And the emphasis, the proper emphasis upon the parchment. Let me tell you something. There is a great comfort that we have from the word of God. We're able to take the word of God and read it. Study it. To know it. These little disciple books, that's only one Bible verse. And as I said this morning, there are those in mega churches that if they can get their people and they promote their people, just read the Bible one minute a day. Read the Bible one minute a day. Read the Bible one minute a day. Let me tell you, you read the Bible one minute a day, and that's 366 minutes a year. That's not a lot of Bible reading. Let me tell you something. We need the Bible. We need to get in the Bible and read the Bible and study the Bible and to know the Word of God. And then last of all, notice his companion. Verse 11. Only Luke is with me. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark. Now that's John Mark that Paul said was not ready for the second journey. He went on the first missionary journey and he quit. He quit on God. And yet he left back. And now he's ready to come. And so Paul says, Luke is with me. Take Mark. Bring him with thee. For Mark is profitable to me for the ministry. Don't give people up. And don't give up on people. God is still working in their hearts and their lives. There was a time as a teenager I quit going to church. I started dropping out of church and mucking out stalls at Willowbrook stables so I could ride horses on weekends. We were so poor we couldn't afford horses. But I found out after school if I go muck out stalls that on Saturday and Sunday I could take folks out on a trail ride. But they had oh, several hundred acres and I'd be one of the, the, uh, ran, uh, the, the, the ranch hands that would ride along on these trail rides. Didn't cost me a penny other than monking out stalls all week. And I got away from church. I got away from God. And I had a Sunday school teacher who wrote me a letter and reminded me how faithful I was at one time. And that she was praying for me. She was a pastor's wife. Betty Ledbetter. And she says, I'm praying for you. And that letter, I wish I'd kept it, but that letter spoke to my heart. And I started going back to church, and I'm so glad I did. I'm so glad I did. Don't give up and don't quit. Just because somebody's not here today and they were here last year and they're not here now, don't give up on them. God's still working on them. And John Mark is profitable for the ministry. Bring him. He needed Timothy. He needed John Mark. We have too many Demases and not enough John Marks in the world. 
we need to realize that God is able to give us those companions that will travel with us down our road as we serve Him. Winter's coming. Praise God for the comfort and the protection that God gives to us each and every one. Do thy diligence to come before winter.